For the last three weeks, we've been looking at this test, this test of the tongue. We've been looking at James and his challenge to really evaluate our faith. His challenge for us to evaluate our faith in light of not only what is on the inside, but even what is on the outside. How do we act? Is our faith real? You see, even in James' day, the problem of hypocritical belief and hypocritical Christianity was a severe problem in the first century. This morning we come to our third part of the test of the tongue. Yes, the tongue had three parts because it's kind of a a big issue here, a very big test. So for the last two weeks, we've looked at James's rather condemning passage. If you're new to us this morning, the passage that Mr. Spee read doesn't provide a whole lot of anything except extreme critique of our lives very often and the words that we either speak or the words that we write. Well, this morning we recognize that James ends this. If you look down there at verse 12, look at verse 12 with me on the box on your page. It says, Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. He stops there with this particular passage on the tongue, challenging us to consider how inconsistent a sinful tongue is with a saved heart. And he doesn't offer a whole lot of do's and don'ts. He doesn't offer a lot of helpful hints. He doesn't offer a lot of encouragement on how to get a hold of the tongue. Actually, he's just said it's untamable. In fact, let's remember what he said here. And you have your review here. And if you're new to us this morning, this will help you. Um, If you've been with us all through, this will, you, you just try to really See if you can't answer a few of these that I've left blank. But James chapter 1, verse 26 in the previous chapter reminded us of this great principle. And there it is on the outline. It says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is what? Is worthless. So if you think yourself to be a person of faith and a person of God but yet there's no control of your tongue, either in lying, in deceit, in cursing, in gossip, in disunity, in abuse, in triviality. You see that the sins of the tongue are very, very wide. Or how about this? We saw last week in ideology, It's very interesting that the Sunday that I mentioned Karl Marx and communistic manifesto, the leftist ideologies that has kept a a whole Caribbean nation prison for over 50 years, it's interesting that Fidel Castro has has died. Some have said, Pastor, I I don't know what to say about that. I, I, I have to tell you that there's, there's a joy in my heart that he is no longer in control of that nation. And I would say to you, that's, that's not an unbiblical idea. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 10 says that when the righteous prosper, the people rejoice, a city rejoices, but when, a wicked, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. Now, we do not revel in someone going to hell. We do not rejoice. That is for God to take care of vengeance. That is for God to condemn and to judge, and he is glorified in judging sin. But in the same regard, we can rejoice that an evil influence is no longer over a people in, that, in the way that it was. So, I, I believe if you go down to Calle Ocho, 
and you march with the folks this afternoon in joy over the fact that he's gone. You're not sinning unless you are rejoicing that, he's, that he is in hell, and that is not for you to do. But you can rejoice that he is gone. Friends, the, the heart is the issue here. Notice here with me, number one, the tongue refers to our words, but number two, and this is a big one for us, in fact, I'd encourage you to put a circle th around that whole number two in the passage underneath it, the tongue reveals our heart. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus is speaking, and he says it so clearly. Would you read that little text out loud with me underneath the number two? For the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. Let's read that again. For the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. Jesus said this. Jesus said that our tongue reveals our heart. And so if, there is, if there's boasting that is coming out of our mouth, then that recognizes, that reveals that there is pride in our hearts. If there's all kinds of lying and, and self-aggrandizement through exaggeration or just fabrication, then that indicates that a heart is not at peace with who God is and who you are before God. There's, there's all kinds of perversity that is coming down. If there's, if there's cursing, and if there's profanity that's coming out of a mouth, then that means that there's a crudeness down in the heart. That means that there's a, a vanity in the heart and a profanity in the heart. You see, our, our mouths reveal what's in our hearts. And that is very important. I had you circle that number two one because that is going to play into the second side of the sheet in just a moment. Look at number three. The tongue is the vehicle of many sins. Number four, the tongue equals our fingertips. So this applies to what we write as well as what we say. Number five, the tongue is very small but very what? Powerful. Do you remember the things that we talked about? What goes in a horse's mouth? A bit. And yet the whole horse is guided. The little rudder on the back of a ship. Does anybody remember what percentage of the whole surface that is? One to two percent. One to two percent of the whole length of a ship and the surface area of a, the hull of a ship at the water, in only one to two percent of it can guide a ship. That's how powerful the comparison is for our tongue. Your tongue guides so much about your life. Look at the third one that is there in, or, or in the text that we were talking about. Such a small spark creates a forest fire. We remember that. How about number six? The sins of the tongue are easy to commit, but difficult to quit. They're easy to commit, but they're difficult to quit. In fact, you could put out there impossible to quit. And that's what we see James saying, who has tamed the tongue? Notice the next part that is here, number seven. A sinful tongue reveals gross inconsistency with saving faith. And this is really what James is getting at. Many claim to know God, but they don't. And it's revealed by their tongue, the sins of their tongue. Number eight, there's a tension between what is and what ought to be. And James doesn't really rectify that tension. He leaves it there. And so this morning, we, we recognize that. Last week, the number 9, 10, and 11 were from last week. And you remember all of these came from what verse? Verse 6, chapter 3 and verse 6. The tongue is a destructive, terrorizing fire. The tongue is comprehensive in its destruction, and the tongue is ignited by who? Satan himself. So what do we do about this toxic, raging tongue that so often reveals our foreignness to God and our distance from God. What can be done 
about the tongue. Well, as I think about what can be done about the tongue, I I would say the first thing that we need to recognize is what won't work in dealing with the tongue. You know, sometimes it's important to rule out some things before you start going forward and finding solutions. So let's go ahead and rule out something that is very important, I believe, for evangelical churches in this present day and time, as it would be the case for any time, but especially now, we need to have this said in the open. What will not work is behavior modification. Behavior modification. This is trying to get certain behavior. Just trying to get somebody to do something or not do something. Behavior modification through moralistic, therapeutic deism. What in the world did the pastor just say? <laughs> Behavior modification, just, you know, it, it's, it's very much like this. When a mom is at home and she has her children there at home, some of you have two, some of you have three or four, um, perhaps children, and, and they're very young, and do they always get along perfectly and wonderfully? No. And one of the great struggles is for us to teach our children to love one another and to deal with one another in a, in a loving and respectful way, right? And, and one of the things that can push a mother, including my own mother, to the edge of her sanity and to the edge of her Christianity is children who fight. But even if you're able to, as I I was reading one mother's comments, even this week on this issue of behavior modification, what she was writing and what she was saying was so good and so true. She said, what perhaps burdens me most about my young children is, is not that they just fight in the open with one another and, and that I'm having difficulty stopping this behavior and getting this, but this is a representation of what's down in their hearts. And she's saying, even if I get them to stop hitting one another or stop being mean to one another and stop doing these things to agitate one another, have I really dealt with their heart? I remember that my mother, um, she dealt with us on that. I hadn't planned on sharing this, but I I was just remembering one of the things that she said as she worked through this rationally between me and Kelly and Mark, because sometimes we did not get along very well. I remember she used to say this, if you kids keep fighting now while you're children, you will fight when you're adults, and you will hate one another. And I want you to know that she said, you... You need to set the precedent of learning to love. Not only because of a potential judgment, a potential negative thing in the future, but eventually she was able to weave down into our heart the heart truths that went beyond mere behavior modification. But here's the deal. If we only do behavior modification on Christian issues in our lives that is based upon a be good, a moralistic, therapeutic deism, which means this religiosity that you really ought to do this, you really ought to behave in this way. If we simply go after behavior modification and the the behavior of our daily lives on the surface without getting down to the root of the issue, it's only a matter of time until either it comes back, the same negative behavior comes back, or, listen to this, it manifests itself in another way, in another area. So what what is the issue here is going back to Jesus' words that when it comes to the tongue, he's saying, you have a heart problem. And so what I would like to do this morning is to recognize that if you want to fix your tongue, fill it in, you need to fix your heart first. 
If you have trouble getting angry and flying off the handle and saying all kinds of things that you regret, which many of us in this room, perhaps that is our issue, or many of us in this room, it may be lying, it may be, it may be simply lying to get out of problems or get out of trouble or lying to, to make a sale or lying to um, work something out to your advantage. Or as I spoke of, some, some people um, have, a, have a problem with lying just uh, in gross exaggeration that, that, you, that you are seeking to cause others to think highly of you by, by saying um, certain things about either what you've done or where you've been or, or something that you, that you have. Or maybe it's boasting in one way or another. And, you know, boasting doesn't always have to look like the, the big, you know, strong, strapping, loud Gaston figure. Sometimes it can be a very quiet little thing that is said to your, your friend or your sister that just makes them to feel inferior to you. You see, that can be boasting by perhaps the quietest of among us. The, sun, the sins of the tongue can be very wicked, and what we need to recognize is that those things are not fixed by mere behavior modification through therapy with a higher power in itself. The long-term real issue is that we need to fix our heart, and here's what we need. We need a total heart makeover. That's what we need. You've seen Total Truck Makeover on television, perhaps. I don't know. I've never seen it. I just saw it advertised. You've seen Total House. Is it called Total House Makeover? What is it called? Extreme something or another makeover. Okay, where they go in, they take somebody's house, and they take this disastrous house, and they turn it into something incredible. I want you to know Marcy's brother bought one of those houses in L.A., and they're now living in it. They, in fact, they didn't know how bad the place was until after they had bought it. And then the neighbors started coming out saying, oh, man, are we glad this came along. It was one of the TV programs. It was on television. You can look it up. I don't know, I don't know which one. I, I, I've seen it. But, but Jason and Amanda, they came to this house. It was in a nice little neighborhood, and it was, it was beautiful. Everything was redone. Some company had come in and just made it absolutely fantastic and the price was right and he kind of knows about construction so he looked around and he really looked at it and they had fixed everything right it made a, a completely new home there was just so you were aware there were 27 cats living in the house before they did yeah some of you are yeah look at Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 <laughs> I'm not going to even go any further. Look at Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of what? Stone. And give you a heart of flesh. Now here's the amazing thing. Ezekiel is not saying that God tells us, go turn your heart from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Ezekiel is saying that God says this. God is the one speaking here. And God is saying, I will make you, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You see, the great solution to the tongue is dealing with the root of the matter, and that is the heart. And where is all of this found? It's found in the Word. It's found in the Word. Okay, well, Pastor, which Word are you speaking of? Because you would remember with me that there is the Word that is the person of Christ. You say, really? Yes. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn with me to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John in chapter 1. Take your Bible. 
Turn over there. If you need to look up in the front index, that's fine. Just look it up. I want you to see John chapter 1 and verse 1. Which word are we talking about here? This is a deep concept that Christians need to understand. You see, it, it's not going to help you if I share with you the little doodads of, okay, when you're angry, count to ten. If you're really angry, do what? Count to a hundred, you know. If, you, if you're angry and you get the email, write the email. You're going to send it back and wait till the next morning. I mean, th those, are, those are nice tips. Those are good tips. You know, l let me just say to you that by and large, you should never try to solve any, any interpersonal conflict through email or through text or through Facebook. Don't do it. Nothing is solved through email. Email just really, in the long run, typically makes things worse. Why? Because God has made us to look at one another. He's given us facial expressions. He's given us the intonation in our voices in order to truly communicate with one another. And when you reduce it just to words, it can be taken a million different ways. And Satan loves to have a heyday with that. As soon as you realize you have a communication problem, what you need to do, at the very least, is pick up the phone. And if you can, you need to be face-to-face. -face. You say, but I can think it all out. If I write it, I've got time to think it all out. That's part of the problem. <laughs> be careful. What very often happens is when there's a problem and it goes to the email sparring, what happens is you get pitted more in your position and they get pitted more in their position and then the volleys are shot and as the volleys are shot, they're even more misunderstood. It's better when you have a problem to speak, to be careful. Maybe you need to take time and settle down pray, make sure your heart is right, and then the right words come out of your mouth. But we're not going to do a sermon about all that. What we're going to really do is look and see the big issue of what makes all of our speech, what makes all of our words honor God, and it comes through the solution of the word. Now, what is the word? There's two aspects of the word. There's the person of Christ and there is scripture. But we're going to see here um, that it really is both of these because God, listen in right out there to the side, God cannot be separated from his word. God is truth. He in him there is no darkness whatsoever. In him there is no falsehood whatsoever. He is the essence of truth. Notice in John chapter 1, John makes it so clear to us. In John 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And what does it say? And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So this is the creator. He, I mean, verse 2 and verse 3 reveal to us this is the creator. He was before the beginning. He was in the beginning. Look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And so this picture, who is he speaking of here? He's speaking of the coming Messiah. He's speaking of Jesus Christ. He is saying that Jesus is the Word. In fact, Jesus would call himself the, the living Word. His words are life. His words are are like the, they are the living water, the bread of life. He is equated with each of these, and when it comes to him being the word, 
it is inseparable from who he is. And so we need Christ and we need his truth. We need Christ. If we have Christ, we have his truth. If we have his truth, we have Christ. This is the picture that God cannot be separated from himself and his truth. Look at John 14, 6. Jesus said, and it's right there on your outline, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, should be no one, not no once, no one comes to the Father except through me. In John 4, 12, we see that the word of God is living and it's active. And notice what it does. At the end of verse 12, it says, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, the heart is the issue. And what God does, what Christ does through his word and through his presence is he reveals the need of our heart. He reveals the condition of our heart. And listen to this. James has been pounding away at us like any Old Testament prophet would do in revealing the sin problem. He's bringing up the issue and bringing up to our all prominence the problem that must be dealt with. And what James is helping us see is that our sinful hearts are expressed through our tongues. And if our tongues have poison coming out of them, then it's revealing to us that this is an inconsistent life with the life of Christ for his people. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Jesus says, Already you are clean because the word I have spoken to you. See, the word comes and cleans us. This is Christ coming and he washes over us with who he is and what he does. Not only in going to the cross, but revealing to us his truth. Look at John 17, verses 7 through 11, or 17 through 19. He says, Jesus is praying for us. And in his prayer, he says, sanctify them in what? In the truth. Your word is truth. And so Jesus praying to the Father. This is God the Son praying to God the Father. And he is praying for the sanctification of his disciples. He's praying that they will be made holy. Listen, he's praying that their words and their heart will reflect him. And in doing so, he's saying, Lord, cleanse them with your word. Cleanse them with truth. So the answer to our tongue issue, the answer to our heart problem of sinfulness is found, number one, in genu the need for genuine salvation. We need genuine salvation. And what I mean by this is conversion to faith in Christ. That's what genuine salvation is. It's no longer are you ultimately trusting in anything else, not anything that you do, not anything that someone else has done other than what Christ has done. Now, you say, well, isn't that obvious? Isn't that, yeah, sure, I claim to be a Christian, and I walked down an aisle when I was 8 years old or when I was 18 years old or, or, or whatever may be the case. Listen, friends, here's part of the problem. Our, our revivalistic movement of the last 200 years that indicated the need for you to do something in order to indicate a decision for Christ or to indicate some type of spiritual thing, that can either be helpful in helping people define the fact that they have come to a point of surrender to Christ, but it may also be deceptive if that has not truly happened, but people say, well, I walked out an aisle and I filled out the card. Well, maybe it could even be this. I was baptized. But if there's no change, if there's no fruit as a result of that, or if, there is, if there's no real ongoing spiritual life that indicates a heart pursuing God, growing in grace, growing in the truth of who God is and what he's done and what he's called us to do, then that would indicate that whatever thing that you're pointing to from so many years ago was not genuine. 
we need to be willing to evaluate that in our lives. The Bible tells us over and over again to, to examine your heart, to test yourselves, to see that you're in the faith. And part of the testing ourselves to see if we're in the faith, James is saying, listen to your tongue. Read your emails. Read your Facebook postings. This is one of the indicators of whether or not you know God. Because you can't just respond the way the world responds. You can't just respond in a selfish heart. You cannot respond simply in a boasting, earthly, world-loving self and know God. God's children act differently. God's children, you see, their, their Facebook account is saved along with their heart. Their wardrobe is saved. Their vocabulary is saved. Their business practices are saved. Their interactions, listen, their interactions with their husband or their wife are in, brought into conformity with Christ. Now, I'm not saying that we may not struggle. I'm not saying that we, we don't sometimes deal with this, this flesh that comes up. But what I'm saying is, is that if our life is characterized by this battle of the heart, reflecting the world far more than it reflects God, then James is saying, your faith is worthless. So, the need for genuine salvation and conversion to faith in Christ. And how, how, how does that occur? That, that occurs when a human heart comes before God and recognizes, Lord, I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. And that you have come. I mean, this candle's almost gone, but there it is. It's, it, it's part of our emphasis of saying, you have come to give your life that I may live. And so, Lord, I no longer trust in myself. I no longer trust in anything or anyone else except the, the cross of Christ, your sacrifice that I might live, and I turn to live in faith in you and not myself. Now, that is the picture of genuine salvation. And genuine salvation is always going to be accompanied with this. Number two, the need for ongoing sanctification. It's the, the picture of this. That we, what you say, what is sanctification? And you can put on there becoming holy or becoming like Christ. Those two things are the same because Christ is holy Becoming like Christ, and that's just down below. And this has to do with growing in faith and purity. That's the picture. Growing in faith and purity. And so, the answer to the tongue is number one, genuine salvation. Are you saved? If, if, it's not a bad thing if you come and listen to Pastor Andrew and Pastor Ben and Pastor, all, all of the... the messages of this series and say, well, these things are revealing that I may not know God. That's okay. That's what his word does. He reveals to us that we have need of him. Now, I want you to notice Hebrews chapter 19, Galatians 2.20, Romans chapter 12. These, these have to do, I, I was going to try to separate these um, as saying one, you know, being under number one, genuine salvation, and the others being under sanctification. But if you really look at these, they are together. Salvation and sanctification go together. That is God's design. It's not the design that when you're eight years old, you come down an aisle, you get saved, and then go live however you want. Well, I guess I got that taken care of. Glad I'm going to heaven. Beware. Maybe not. If your salvation is aisle deep as opposed to heart deep, you may be one of the ones that Jesus said, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Those are strong words. 
And that passage should cause us to really look and to see our faith and evaluate our faith. Am I trusting in Christ and am I growing in Christ? Because these two things go together. And we can see it in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 19. He says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, isn't that beautiful? We can confidently come into the holy place. We can confidently go to God because of the blood of Jesus. You see, it's not by your works. It's not by your grandmother's prayers. It's not your great uncle who was a Baptist preacher. It's not any of those things. It's by the blood of Jesus that you're trusting in the blood of Jesus. So we see salvation here. Look at verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, In verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, one whose heart has been sprinkled clean with a a clean conscience and, and that their fleshly life has been washed with the the living word of Christ, the living waters of Christ, you're going to say and speak in a way that represents him and not the world. Notice verse 23. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You see, this is continuing on with the Lord. This is continuing on with sanctification. This is continuing to live out your faith. Let us hold fast and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Now, I've put two lines out there to the side. And the, the reason is, the first, the first two verses, actually 19 through 21, that's sanctification. Excuse me, excuse me, don't write things. That's salvation, salvation, sorry. The top part of that is, we, we have a great high priest who's bought our, our salvation. He's, he's caused us to be able to enter the holy place. No one can come to the Lord without the blood of Christ. But look at the next one there underneath that, just right out there to the side. You see the rest of those verses dealing with sanctification. So the first one is your salvation, and the second one is your, sal- your sanctification. This is the answer to controlling and taming the tongue is that we've been changed. Look at Galatians 2.20. We see the same thing. We see salvation and we see sanctification here. Look at verse, chapter 2 and verse 20 of Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Those are some of the most precious words that a human could ever come to understand. You see, that first part deals with salvation. I've been crucified with Christ. Pablo was buried in the waters of baptism this afternoon or this morning, representing his salvation in Christ, that Jesus died was laid in the tomb and rose again. Pablo was laid down in the water symbolizing the death of faith in self, the death of life in sin, and symbolizing the resurrection to a new life in Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about. So my question to you is, have you been crucified with Christ? Have you come to the place at the end of self and beginning with Christ? Jesus calls us to really look and evaluate, have I come to the Savior in faith? 
Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is very similar. Look what he says there in verses 1 and 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Now, that word, therefore, I've highlighted it on the screen, and you can circle it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. What that refers back to is the chapters before it that is dealing with salvation. Dealing with salvation of the followers of Christ, dealing with salvation for the nation of Israel. And in fact, chapter 11 ends in a doxology of praise. It ends with a big praise statement over the hope of Israel being found in Christ. This is salvation. And so the picture here when we get to chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is, since you're saved, that's what the therefore is there for. Since you're saved, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is how you live your life. Look at verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't talk like this world. Don't think like this world. Don't act like this world. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. That by testing, that is the picture of that you are testing everything that comes at you. Is this from God? Is this not from God? Is this the way of God? Is this not the way of God? Is this the holiness that God calls me to? Is this, is this who he created me to be in him? You see, this is, this is the careful testing. Young people, you live in an America that's very different than the old people, the, the older Christians that are here in this room. The older Christians in this room lived in a different place. And in, in many ways, you are going to be tested even more and more and more. And, and it's going to get complicated for you. And I want to encourage you that as you are in the Word, as you hear the truth, and as you evaluate the thinking of the world, that is how you test and you see how to live and speak and to honor Christ as a Christian. So look at verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may test and discern what is the will of God. And then here he's... he's defining it more, what is good and acceptable, and what does it say? And perfect. Why? Because God is good, and he can tell you what is acceptable or not acceptable. It's binary. It's either zero or one. It's either yes or no. Is this good and acceptable and perfect? God, by his grace, gives Christians the opportunity to live with this knowledge. And not only to live with this knowledge, but as we saw in Galatians 2.20, he comes to live this truth in us. So the way that my tongue gets arrested, the way that the issues that reveal themselves of the sinful heart get arrested is that Christ comes and he gives me a new heart. And that's not a one-time event only. It is for salvation, but over and over and over again, Jesus said that we are called to die daily and follow Christ. Now, in a very practical way, I, I want to end the message with this great admonition. That this word, and is the word Christ or is the word the Bible? What's the answer to that? Is the word Christ or is the answer the Bible? Which one is it? Very good. It's both. Trick question, right? The answer is yes. Truth. He can't be separated from his truth and who he is. So as we live in Christ, as we live in the word, as we live in the living word, He's come, and he saved us from our sin, and he's come, and he is, re Romans 12, he's, we're renewing our mind based upon the truth. This is the way in which we find victory in daily life. Now, I want you to think about this with me. When Jesus had lived 30 years, 
and he began his ministry. What is one of the major events just before he began his ministry did he, did he go and do? He went and he spent 40 days in the wilderness with his heavenly father. Jesus went and fasted for 40 days. He went and he disciplined his body and he disciplined himself being human, yet being God, he was both infinitely, beautifully. And he disciplined himself in this way, seeking after the heart of God. And when he was perhaps most vulnerable, Satan came to him seeking to stop him from the ministry that he was about to start, which was going to wind up with him going to the cross, paying for our sins, and rising again that we could be truly the children of God. Satan came to him deceiving him, tempting him. And every, with all three of those temptations, every single time Jesus responded with what? The word of truth. Jesus quoted to him Scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Over and over again, when the world came at Christ, when Satan came to deceive and Satan came to tempt him to not fulfill the calling of his incarnation. It was the word by which Jesus taught us to respond to Satan. Listen, there's no need for you to get in an argument with Satan with your own intellect. That is a dangerous thing to do. The safest thing for you to do is that when Satan comes tempting you to despair, when Satan comes tempting you to look elsewhere for hope, when Satan comes tempting you to simply gratify, gratify the flesh, when Satan comes tempting you to do that which is not honoring to the Savior who died for you, listen to this. Your response, my response, the response of victory is always going to be the Word of God. Look at Psalm 119, verses 9 through 13. I love this. And I encourage every person in this room to memorize these verses. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. By guarding it according to thy word. With my whole heart I seek you. Look at verse 10, middle part. Let me not wander from your commandments. Look at verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Teach me your commands, your decrees. This is the way that we continue in Christ. This is how the tongue is controlled, is that Christ comes and changes our heart and His Word continually guides us to walk in the path of life in the truth of His Word. Now, this is part of the reason that we have a Bible supply store. This is part of the reason that we encourage you to have God's Word and to feed on God's Word daily. This is why you need to develop a quiet time. This is why it's important for you to have devotions with God. This is why you need to have the spiritual discipline. Listen, as a Christian, not because you want to be saved, but because you are saved, that you would spend time with God in His Word and in prayer. There are people who come to me and say, Pastor, I just can't get, do this Christian life thing. I can't stop sinning. I can't overcome this. I can't overcome that. I get angry with my wife or I get angry with my children. I, I, I keep going back to these vice sins. I just can't do this. The Christian life is not cut out for me. And, and I begin to ask, well, are you in God's Word? No. In your sporadic at church, you, you, you haven't locked and loaded with the church family. And so you, you kind of come 
when there's big problems, but when things are good, you're gone? How can you expect to continue to walk in the narrow way in a world that's gone crazy in your own flesh and, and you, get, you, you wonder why you're not making it? His word has told us over and over and over again, all who are godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer hardship. This is not the easy way. This is the narrow road. In the long run, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But friends, that's only in comparison to the disasters of the ravages of sin. We find that the way of Christ very often is hard and the, tr the struggle that is there is real. But listen, as we feed upon his word, as we, listen to this, as we stay connected with brothers and sisters who too are not perfect but seeking to walk faithfully, that is how we make it. And so, I, I think James is calling us to do these two things that we've talked about over and over again. Number one, are you really saved? And number two, are you growing in Christ? So ask this, have you been converted? Have you? If, if you've been coming and you've been listening and you, you've said, well, I'm not sure of that. Listen, I want to encourage you to seek the Lord and I want to encourage you to seek out someone here and call or come and make an appointment. Come talk to me. Come talk to the others as we pray. Get that issue settled. Convert your faith from faith in self or faith in something else to faith in Christ. You see, the conversion of the heart is where it begins. But secondly, am I growing? I mean... I believe that this is a big issue. I believe that for, for a long time in American churches, it's fi been fine to just be a part of a church, to show up, but to not be growing in Christ. Every single one of us in this room needs to be growing because, listen, at all times, you're either moving closer to God or moving further away. There's no such thing as a static relationship with God. And the person in this room that seems to have the most gentle, Christ-like life that seems to be a long way from anything in the world, there is still the temptation to seek to coast. And when we coast, God is saying, I'm calling you to come and walk with me in intimacy. Come walk with me in your cancer. Come walk with me in, your, in the struggles of getting older and the struggles of this earthly life. And, and I know that, that many, for many Christians, the struggles even become more intense as they, as they approach the finish line. But Christ calls us to grow in faith and in faithfulness. So perhaps there is the question, how should I respond to this challenge of James? Am I converted? Am I growing? How do I respond to this?